Part five of Cecil's Own Book by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fairy Gift or the Iron Bracelets. Once upon a time, that is the way all fairy stories used to begin. Once upon a time, there lived a little boy called Fritz. His home was on the banks of the beautiful stream that came tumbling over the rocks at the back of the hut in which he and his grandfather dwelt. For Fritz had no parents, but had always lived with his grandfather, who earned his livelihood by catching fish in the stream and selling it to the great lords and ladies who lived in the castles in the neighbourhood. When he was not fishing, he cultivated a small garden in which Fritz helped him, that was their work in summer, but after all the vegetables had been stowed away, and the dried fish had been hung up on the rafters of the hut, for it was but a hut in which they lived, though it was always very clean, they sat by the fire during the long evenings, making wooden toys for children. But Fritz never found it dull, for his kind old grandfather told him stories of all the wonderful countries he had seen when he was a young man and a soldier. He taught Fritz to read and to write, as well as to make the little wooden toys which he sold in the spring to the children at the castles around. And Fritz was very obedient to his dear old grandfather, whom he loved very much. He had one pet, a beautiful cat. He had found it one day when it was a kitten, nearly starved and half drowned, for some cruel person had thrown it into the stream but it had fallen amongst the reeds and rushes near the bank, and so Fritz was able to get it out. It was nearly dead with wet and hunger and fright, but he took it home and gave it some warm milk, and wrapped it up in an old jacket, and put it near the fire. And it soon got well, and grew to be the most beautiful cat that was ever seen in that country, and the cruel man who had thrown it into the stream wanted to buy it, that he might give it to the wife of the great lord under whom he lived, in order to gain her favour. But Fritz would not part with his favourite for any money, though he was poor, and money would have bought him many things he would have liked to have. It happened one day, as Fritz was playing by the side of the stream, he saw something bright glittering in the sun. It was hanging on a reed by the edge of the river, where he was just able to reach it with a little stick he had in his hand. When he got it onto the bank and looked at it, he clapped his hands and quite shouted for joy. It was a small gold girdle, most beautifully made, for it was as soft and flexible as a ribbon, though it was set with the finest diamonds and emeralds and rubies. Fritz knew that they were precious stones, for sometimes when he went to sell fish or toys at the castle, he saw the great lady there, and she wore a girdle round her waist, and a circlet on her head, set with pearls that were very beautiful. But they were not to be compared with these. It was not likely that they should be, for this tiny belt belonged to the queen of the fairyland nearest to Fritz's home, and the gnomes of the mountains had been twenty years collecting them for her. But Fritz did not know that till long afterwards. He only thought what a great deal of money he could sell them for, and what a nice cottage he would build for himself and his grandfather, and how he would hire a man to fish and to dig the garden, and let the poor old man rest all the remainder of his life. So he took the beautiful girdle, and wrapped it up in his blouse, and ran home as fast as ever he could. His grandfather had gone to a town some miles off to buy twine to make fishing nets of, and would not return that night. So Fritz had no one to show his treasure to but Pussy, who was asleep on his grandfather's easy chair. He called out as soon as he got into the house. Wake up, Silky Paws! That was her name. Wake up and see what I've found. And when I've sold the gems, you shall have a red collar with a silver bell to it, that you shall, dear old Silky Paws. And Pussy got up and pawed, and opened her great round eyes, and stared as he shook the glittering thing before her. But I do not think she understood anything about it, and would have thought a nice shining fish just caught in the stream a much lovelier sight. 
for a cat however handsome and good it may be can only have a cat's mind and a cat's taste finding that pussy did not care to look at his treasure he took it into the little closet in which he slept and put it on the window seat close to his bed and then gave silky paws her supper which she liked much better than the fine jewels it was a beautiful moonlight night and the last thing fritz saw before going to sleep was the moonlight streaming through the window and falling on the fairy girdle he had not been long asleep before he was awakened by someone quite close to him repeating his name the voice was very low and sweet yet it awoke him completely and he started up in bed and looked in the direction from which the sound came and in the window seat where lay the girdle he saw standing upon the moonbeam on which she had glided down from cloudland where she had been to visit some of her distant relations the fairy queen herself she was so beautiful and smiled so sweetly that fritz was not at all afraid though he had never seen any lady before so very very small or dressed in such curious clothes for her robe was of gossamer worn over a petticoat of the rarest pink rose petals her mantle was of the richest purple heartsease trimmed with the white silky down of the marsh cotton grass necklace of dewdrops with a photograph suspended from it of the fairy king done on water by a new process headdress of hummingbird plumes train of the phosphorescence of the sea a perfectly new discovery of the court milliners hair powdered with stardust to give the fashionable tint i know i am quite correct about her costume for it had appeared in the fairy court journal just before fritz waited respectfully for her to speak first and at length she said after looking at the girdle at her feet i have come little boy to ask you to give me back the girdle that you found by the river to-day for it is mine fritz ventured to say but madam who told you i had found it there was no person near when i took it off the reeds oh she replied i do not need mortals to tell me what i want to know i am the fairy queen and i understand the language of the birds and the insects and the flowers and the trees and i ask them when i want to know anything a kingfisher who was standing on a stone in the middle of the river watching for minnows saw me drop my girdle as i was floating past to visit my cousins in sunset land as it was nothing he could eat the greedy creature he told the water ouzel about it and he glad to have a bit of news to repeat told it to the skylark who was just quitting her nest to take her daily exercise high up in the soft evening air and she waited to tell me as i came down for though she flies high she cannot reach cloudland as we fairies can but when i came to the river my girdle was gone so i inquired of the reeds what had become of it but the reeds are more clever at singing or sighing than observing and they sung something of which the only words i could distinguish were lost 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 so i turned from them to the bright wide awake yellow water lilies that keep their heads above water and their eyes open and they told me at once that the little boy fritz who lived in the hut close by had taken it away fritz thought i will pull up those tattling water lilies to-morrow and throw them on the bank for telling but he did not dare to say so and it was wrong of him to want to keep the jewel now that he knew to whom it belonged but you see it was a great temptation for him to wish to keep it for he was very poor and wished so much to get nice things for his old grandfather but it was only for a moment or two that these bad thoughts remained in his mind and he took up the girdle and held it to the fairy saying it is yours i must not keep what is not my own then she smiled very pleasantly on him and clasped it round her waist and said i will leave you a gift which you must never part with until you are a very old man and then she glided up the moonbeam and was gone when she was out of sight fritz jumped out of bed to see what she had left him instead of the beautiful belt and he was very much disappointed and ready to cry 
when he saw it was only an iron bracelet. It was made with great care, but still it was only iron. He threw it down on the ground at first, but after a while he thought, the fairy queen would not give me a thing that was worthless. She is too good to ridicule and insult me when I have given her back the girdle she prizes so much. I will do as she told me, and put this bracelet on and never part with it till I am a very old man, too old to work. So Fritz clasped it on his right arm and fell asleep again, and dreamed wonderful dreams of gold and gems hidden in the mountains, of which he was filling a basket, when, with tremendous noise, a side of the cavern fell down, and a door made all of one diamond flashed on him, and he awoke with a great start, and found the morning sun shining full on his face through the little window, and his grandfather knocking with his big oak stick on the door. Then Fritz jumped up quickly, and opened the door for the old man, who wondered to have found him asleep after the sun had risen, for he did not know the boy had been kept awake in the night, talking to the fairy. Now it happened, some weeks after this, that the old fisherman died, and Fritz was left all alone in the hut, with no one in the whole world to care for him, and after the people in the valley had buried his grandfather, he sat down by the fire, very sad, wondering what he must do. At last he determined to go to the castle, and ask if they would give him work. He did not mind how hard he worked, if he could only earn enough to buy him food and clothing, for he was strong and hated to be idle. But during that night a terrible thunderstorm came on, and the river, swollen by the heavy rain, overflowed its banks, and the water began to pour into the hut, and at the same time a flash of lightning set fire to the thatch. Poor Fritz had only just time to escape through the window, and began to scramble up the rocky hill at the back of the house, when he saw Silky Paws near the door, who was so terrified at the sight of the water, that she could not move for fear, but stood on a stone, mewing piteously. Fritz saw her from the place he had climbed to, and could not bear to watch his poor favourite perish. So he slid down the hill again, and waded to where she was. He was only just in time to save her, for the water was commencing to wash over the stone on which she stood, and in a few minutes she would have been drowned. The water reached now as high as Fritz's knees, and he sometimes feared he should be washed away, but he struggled on, and at last got to the top of the hill, and sat down to rest. The sun had just risen, and Fritz took off his wet clothes and spread them on a rock to dry. And then he looked round to see if there was any way for him to cross the valley, but he could discover none. It looked like a great lake instead of the fertile place he knew so well. All the corn had been washed away, and great trees torn up by the roots. The torrents were dashing down with a frightful noise, and soon he saw his old home, where he had been so happy for years, washed down and whirled away by the roaring waters. From the top of the rocky hill, up which Fritz with difficulty climbed, stretched a wild desolate plain, covered with broken masses of stone, among which grew here and there furze bushes, tufts of heather, and some plants of bilberries, whose fruit was then ripe. It was a dreary prospect Fritz had to look at, when the sun was high enough in the sky for him to see objects distinctly. On one side, the roaring, foaming waters, twirling round the uprooted pine trees that had got fast together in great heaps, or bearing onward fragments of peasants' cottages that had been washed away. On the other side of him, further than his eye could reach, lay the barren, pathless heath, quite unknown to him, but which was nevertheless his only way of safety. But he was a brave boy, and had been accustomed to a life of hardship. So when the sun had dried his clothes, he put them on, and taking Pussy under his arm, he started off. In the pocket of his jacket he found a piece of bread, and when he was tired with walking, he sat down on the dry heather, 
and having gathered some bilberries made a hearty meal at least he thought it one silky paws sat on a stone in the sunshine purring so contentedly that i suspect she had found a dinner off a field mouse or a little bird however i cannot be sure about that at all events she did not seem to want any of her masters then they trudged on again and after some hours walking they found a narrow footpath the sight of it cheered fritz for he thought rightly that it must lead to some dwelling and so it did after a while it became wider and more trodden and just as it began to grow dark he saw before him a bright light such a light as he had never seen before his grandfather had told him of burning mountains that he had seen when he was in distant countries and at first he thought the flames he saw shooting up to the dark sky must come from a volcano but as he drew nearer he saw it was not a mountain but a large building that was before him and the fire came from large furnaces he crept slowly and quietly to the door and peeped in he saw a number of men watching the iron that was being smelted in the furnaces big strong men with faces and hands very black indeed fritz was at first rather frightened when he saw them but he had become very cold and hungry and so at last he ventured in and asked very humbly if he might warm himself near one of the fires one of the men asked him gruffly what he wanted and where he came from so he told them his sad little story and showed them his beautiful pussy who had jumped out of his arms and was sitting winking with her large green eyes at the great fire the men though they were rough in manners and had loud voices were not unkind in heart and one of them who had a boy about the age of fritz who had gone to be a sailor and who was then far away on the seas felt pity for the poor friendless boy and said eh my lad sit down on this old rug and rest yourself and you shall have some supper for i will answer for it that you are ready for a good meal for a crust of bread and bilberries makes but a poor dinner the tears came into fritz's eyes at such unlooked-for kindness and he sat down by the fire and ate his supper and the good man gave some to silky paws and then told fritz he might sleep there if he did not meddle with anything which he promised not to do and soon he was fast asleep the next morning the master of the workmen came and seeing fritz asked who he was and having heard his story said he might stay and work for him at this fritz was very glad and though at first he was rather awkward and often got scolded he tried so hard to do right and was so wishful to please everybody and was so truthful and honest that he became a great favourite with the men and with their master too every one liked him except one surly dark-browed man who was indeed a thief though no one suspected him of being one the reason he hated fritz so much was that one day when he was hiding some pieces of metal which he intended to take away when it was dark fritz came by the place and the bad man thought the boy must have seen what he was doing and would perhaps tell of him he could not however be quite sure that fritz did see him or i am afraid he would have taken some cruel means to have got rid of him that very night but settled in his own mind that he would soon get rid of the poor stranger now it happened that fritz had not seen what the man was doing and was besides so honest himself that he never thought of suspecting others of stealing so for some time everything went on as usual but one morning there was a great consternation at the foundry the men and boys were talking together in groups and the master was in earnest conversation with fritz's enemy in a distant part of the works fritz asked one of the boys what was the matter who answered him very rudely oh you'll know soon enough little hypocrite and then turned away from him at that instant the man who had been first kind to him came up and with grave and sad face told him to come along the master wanted him when he came to where the master was he was told in a stern voice that he must instantly quit the works and if it had not been for the entreaties of your good friend who is one of my best and most honest workmen 
i should have sent you to prison you ungrateful thievish boy said the master poor fritz was quite amazed and for some time could not speak but at last asked in a trembling voice what he had done wrong perhaps you do not call it wrong to steal look at these things and he showed him several valuable articles one a hunting knife beautifully chased and enamelled the master had lost some weeks before and thought he had dropped it on his way home from the works at night fritz looked at the things but did not understand any better than before what it all meant when turning he saw the eyes of the real thief fixed on him with a look of hatred while a wicked smile was on his face as he said to the poor boy oh, oh my fine lad you do not know these pretty things nor how they got into your box tied up in an old handkerchief they did not walk in of themselves did they or maybe you will say mrs silky paws put them there cats do quite as queer things as that if all is true that the cooks say about them and then he gave a cruel little laugh which made poor fritz's heart sink within him indeed indeed i do not know how these things got into my box sir he said humbly but firmly to his master but no one believed him and his master told him to be gone instantly to take his clothes and be off in ten minutes or he should go to prison before the ten minutes were passed with his little bundle in his hand and silky paws walking solemnly beside him as if she knew he was in sorrow poor fritz again set out on his wanderings his heart almost burst with indignation when the boys shouted and sneered at him as he passed but what brought the tears into his eyes was not their rudeness but it was to see his kind old friend shake his head mournfully as he went by for fritz had hoped till then that he at least would not believe him to be a thief when he had got out of sight he sat down on a stone and cried and thought how forlorn and desolate he was but that did not last long it is better to be wrongfully blamed he said to himself than to be suffering now in my own mind for having done wrong i have the fairy's gift yet and somehow i think as long as i have that i shall not starve or be very unhappy so fritz took up pussy and putting a short stick through his bundle he swung it on his shoulder and began to ascend a steep rocky hill he was soon miles away from the foundry he felt more cheerful as he went along the day was fine and the air that came blowing over the wide stony plain he had now reached was pure and bracing and now he felt what a good thing it was that he had not been brought up in a life of idleness and luxury the homely provisions in his bundle tasted delicious as he sat on a stone at noon by a mountain stream eating his dinner while pussy sat washing her face with her paws and looking very contented for she had shared her master's meal and i have no doubt cats take a more cheerful view of cat life when they have had a nice plentiful dinner and most little boys and girls are like them in that respect one cannot be very merry if one be very hungry refreshed with his dinner and rest fritz started again but the further he went the wilder the country grew he was on a great plain strewn with huge pieces of rock and full of noisy dashing streams that came down from the mountains that bounded his view after walking a long time he came to a narrow valley which formed an opening in the hills and down which roared a wide deep river he kept walking along the side of the water for some hours and as night was coming on and he saw no sign of any human being for the first time he began to be afraid he should die of hunger and cold in that desolate place just as the twilight was darkening into night and the stars were one after another peeping through the clear dark blue sky he suddenly came to the end of the valley the mountains far too high for him to climb walled it in and the river on whose banks he had been walking came down them with a noise like thunder and which he had thought as he came up the valley was thunder down it rushed from ledge to ledge of rock 
foaming and dashing as it had done for thousands of years he saw there was no getting out of the valley that way and with a sigh turned round to retrace his steps when what was his astonishment and terror to see no outlet now at the other end it seemed as if the mountains had suddenly closed and fastened him in now he was really terrified and the old eastern stories his grandfather used to tell him of wicked jinns and, and efreets came into his mind and he thought some of them must have got out of the bottles in which Suleiman the wise had fastened them up to hinder them from doing evil and they have come to live in this dismal place and will make a slave of me and perhaps will kill poor silky paws oh what shall i do and for a while he wrung his hands in despair and cried bitterly but catching a sight of his bracelet his courage revived the good and beautiful fairy he said to himself would never have given me this if it was not to be of some use to me it must be a talisman against all the horrors of this place or of the creatures that are in it i will walk quite to the end of the valley and see what is there he did so and found in the side of the mountain a large cavern and going into it saw a passage from it into another but smaller cave into which he went intending to sleep there and there to try in the morning to find some opening through the mountains so putting his little bundle under his head for a pillow he fell asleep he was very tired and hungry but he did not eat the piece of bread he had left because he knew he should want it still more in the morning he had not been asleep long before he was awakened by a strange noise that seemed to come from some cavern near him it was a sound of hammers at first he thought he had been dreaming of working in the foundry but listening a short time he became certain it proceeded from some place near him it was now evening and twilight outside but the cave in which he had taken shelter was quite dark he raised his head and then saw at a great distance a light that looked scarcely bigger than a star and the hammering came from that side he got up and felt with his hands all round the cave till he came to an opening he had not noticed before it was an archway in the rock and led into a longer and loftier passage than the one he had come by and at the end he saw the light gleaming and heard the noise more distinctly feeling his way along the side of the passage very carefully he came at last to a small but beautiful arch made of rock crystal to which the fire inside gave the appearance of ruby fritz was very much astonished and looked cautiously into the cavern to which the crystal arch was the entrance and there a wonderful sight met his eyes the cavern was of great size and very lofty and many smaller ones opened into it and before each of these hung curtains of woven gold with borders of glittering gems fritz thought they were pieces of coloured glass when he saw them first but he afterwards learned they were precious stones found in the middle of the mountains in the large cavern were many little furnaces it was from the fires underneath these that the light he had seen came from though high above his head swinging by golden chains was a very large lamp of the clearest crystal in which rock oil was always burning but it was not these strange sights that amazed him the most it was the curious little beings who were busy working at the furnaces poking at the fires or taking up ladles full of the melted metal to see if it was ready to work they had big heads short bodies and little crooked legs and they laughed and chattered so much that they never heard fritz's footsteps and he was so surprised at what he saw and at the funny appearance of the gnomes that he could not help laughing at last one of them began to dance round and round waving his ladle over his head and he looked so comical that fritz could restrain himself no longer but burst into a loud laugh which the echoes of the cavern repeated till it seemed as if a dozen fritzes were laughing immediately there was a profound silence and poor fritz was frightened at what he had done and sorry at being so rude 
therefore mustering all his courage he walked into the middle of the cavern and taking off his cap made a very low bow to the gnomes who had all left their fires and were standing together in a group who are you and how did you get into the regions of the king of the gnomes said one then fritz told them his story to which they listened very attentively we must take you to the king and he will know whether your story of the fairy queen's gift is true or not for he is a great friend of hers and he is acquainted with the sort of gifts she bestows on mortals it is about time for supper so we will leave off work and take you to his majesty then each one went behind one of the golden curtains to wash and dress and they told fritz where he could find some water to do the same and by the time the gnomes were ready he had put on his best clothes and the little dwarfs seemed quite to approve of him for he was a handsome good-natured boy and they nodded their big heads and smiled as much as to say we think he will do then they told him to follow them and they passed behind the largest curtain that hung at the upper end of the cave the cavern they now entered was entirely made of crystals of all colours in the middle was a small fountain of pale green malachite full of the clearest and purest water at the end of the cavern sat the king of the gnomes on a throne of gold made in the shape of a dragon its body made the seat the two wings made the sides and the scaly turned up tail the back and on the head with its wide open mouth the funny gnome king rested his little feet he had a sceptre that looked exceedingly like a shovel and the shape of his crown was so much like the top of a pair of tongs that fritz could not help thinking that the good dwarfs had borrowed the patterns for their regalia from the fire irons indeed i believe the mischievous little fellows thought it was a good joke to make their sovereign have for ornament what they had for use before the king was a table made of lapis lazuli covered with dishes from which came very savoury odours that made poor fritz feel ten times more hungry than before there was a great flagon of wine in the middle of the table and beautiful cups placed by each plate they were all alike except the king's he had a goblet that blazed with rubies all the plates and dishes indeed everything on the table was of gold and of the oddest forms one great dish was like a turtle and when you took off the upper part you found it was full of turtle soup another was like an ostrich egg in the middle of a dish of sand it was not sand but gold dust that had an omelette in it the salt cellar was in the shape of a nautilus shell the pepper box was the head of a man sneezing as if he had got some of the pepper up his nose and the vinegar cruet was like a very thin woman with such a long spiteful cross face that one of the gnomes as soon as they were seated at table turned it round and hid it with the oil flask which was a jolly fat little puck with a basket of ripe olives the sight of that vinegar face would take away my appetite said the gnome laughing it was made you must know master fritz by my brother yonder when he had a fit of indigestion from eating too many brandy balls into which pounded diamonds had been put for loaf sugar fritz looked very much astonished at any cook even in gnomeland making such an odd mistake he had not learned what joking fellows the gnomes were but before they sat down to supper they all went and bowed to the king one after another at last came fritz rather frightened oh ho oh, said his majesty whom have we here how have you found your way to my dominions without a guide i have sent no one lately up to that fool's land you come from so you could not have had any one to show you the way down here young master then fritz bowing very low told his story all the dwarfs stood round him and looked very pitiful and hoped that the king would believe him as they did let me look at the bracelet said the king so fritz showed it to him all right exclaimed his majesty 
i have known that for many a year the fairy queen will want it back some day it has come through many hands already i dare say that the respectable old antediluvian tubal cain who worked like us in metals had it once on his brawny arm but now it is time to sup and the smell of that soup is enough to give any one an appetite without a twenty-four hours fast like thine fritz then they sat down and such a merry party they were how they did laugh and told such funny stories of the tricks they had played ill-natured people when they went up on the earth they never teased the kind and good ones we will pay off thy old enemy some day fritz said one of them but he answered that he had rather they would help the workman who had been so good to him oh thou shalt do that thyself some day if thou canst keep thy bracelet said the king fritz thought it was very unlikely that he should ever be able to assist any one but as it would have been unpolite for a boy like him to contradict the gnome king he contented himself with thinking it only at last this merry supper was over and as fritz was wondering who would clear away the things and was going to offer to do it himself he saw the table move itself gently on one side a table running about was not at all a wonderful thing down in gnomeland but as fritz did not live in our country and had never heard of mr holm he was very much astonished as soon as the table was on a nice slope all the dishes began to move off the great soup dish went flapping and floundering away first then the omelette dish rolled off but went so fast that it knocked over a neat little frog dish that was hopping quite gracefully away the fowl dishes flew off so they could have done without the table being tilted the cruet tumbled head over heels as if he were a real robin goodfellow the pepper and mustard went one after the other sulkily and the sour-faced vinegar cruet marched off alone the salt cellar sailed past her without notice you see these five were often compelled to be together against their inclinations indeed they had often to be beaten to make them agree at all when all had gone off to the pantry the table turned itself upside down slowly ascended to the top of the cave and rested there till it should be wanted again next day how very convenient it would be in small london rooms if the furniture would put itself away as it does in gnomeland and give people a little more space at evening parties when the table was gone fritz saw a gold couch walk in from a cavern behind the king's seat which was indeed his dressing-room but it was so small that he could only use it after the couch had come out as soon as the couch had jumped and wriggled itself into the front of the throne all the dwarfs bowed to the king and went to bed and fritz with them and in ten minutes he was fast asleep which was well for him or the snoring of his majesty might have kept him awake the gnomes were used to it and snored in a lower key so ended fritz's first evening in the cave of the gnomes the next morning before breakfast the dwarfs began to work they were making a gold dinner service for the fairy queen and as the time for her annual visit was drawing near they were working very hard to get it finished before her arrival fritz stood and watched them for some time and then offered to do anything he could to help them he thought he could do some of the coarser parts of the manufacture and at least he said i can attend to the fires so every day for many months he lived with them and they taught him to work in metals and as he was intelligent and industrious he soon became a skilful workman and was happy and contented but sometimes he sighed and said to himself that he should like to go up to his own world again after a while but he did not say it to the kind little dwarfs fearing they might think him ungrateful for all their goodness to him at last the dinner set which was to be a present from the king of the gnomes to the queen of the fairies was finished and very beautiful it was you i dare say if you had seen it would have thought it a doll's dinner service 
it was so small but it was quite large enough for fairies they are so tiny you know the plate chests were made of ivory bound with bands of gold and lined with quilted satin a beautiful salamandrine had done that for the gnomes because they could not sew she was a great friend of theirs and often came to see them when the weather was warm for she could not bear cold as you may imagine when i tell you that she lived inside a volcano and instead of water to bathe in used fire just sitting down in the flames when she thought she wanted a bath fritz was very anxious to see her he had heard the dwarfs talk so much about her goodness and wonderful beauty and one day when he had made a very bright fire and the flames were blazing up by a fissure in the rock that served for a chimney he saw a lovely creature come gliding through them and then sit down on the edge of the furnace where the gold was bubbling and hissing he knew at once that it must be the salamandrine come to see her friends as soon as they saw her they all crowded round to welcome her and invited her to come down and sit near the king you shall have your own chair of state near his throne they said to her we will put some burning charcoal in the asbestos cushions to make it comfortable but we cannot join you up there on the furnace they said laughing she wore a robe of changeable colour sometimes it looked like flame sometimes blue like the beautiful colours you see in the fire on a frosty night her girdle was of diamonds and she had a band of diamonds on her head and her long golden hair fell in ringlets on her shoulders she was tall and slender and all her movements were graceful like the flames when they bend and waver round a burning piece of wood fritz stood gazing at her with wonder and delight he had never seen anything so lovely in his life before and the little dwarf seemed as if they would kneel down and worship her she smiled very sweetly and then said thanks kind friends i will come down though this seat is certainly very warm and pleasant but i want to chat with the king and i have brought you some metal ready melted i found it near my drawing-room fire yesterday the fires in my home are rather large you know and as they have been burning a few thousand years the place is comfortably aired by this time the gnomes laughed and said they thought it must be so then she stepped down and walked towards the king four of them carrying her chair which was a large piece of furniture for them to carry and had taken them a long time to make but they thought nothing a trouble that they could do for their favourite the little king jumped up in such a hurry when he saw the salamandrine coming that he let his sceptre fall and knocked his crown all awry she smiled and after she and the king had shaken hands she sat down in her chair of state and told him what was going on in the volcano in which she had her palace and about her last visit to iceland to see her relations who lived in mount hecla and of the delicious baths she had while there in the hot springs then refreshments were brought but the wine was so hot that the poor king scalded his tongue while drinking her health but she sipped it and said it was delicious then she examined the fairy queen's dinner service and admired it very much but said gold dishes would not do for her they would melt in her warm kitchen even her crystal was often cracked with the heat then bidding them all good-bye she stepped on to the furnace and ascended with flames through the fissure in the rocks the beautiful fire spirit had scarcely gone away before a noise was heard in the long passage leading to the caverns what can that be said fritz it sounds like the buzzing of bees and he went to the entrance to look and who should he see but the good fairy queen and all her train such a long procession but all so small first came six outriders mounted on wasps which they had tamed and rendered gentle then the queen in her pearl chariot drawn by eight dragonflies whose beautiful gauzy wings of blue and green and gold made the buzzing noise fritz had heard 
and they flew swiftly along with the carriage they were difficult steeds to drive but the coachman could keep them in order troublesome as they were he was a cunning old mosquito from java and if they would not obey him he would just let them feel his sting which did better than a whip the footmen were butterflies there would not have been room for three to stand but they kept their wings shut when behind their mistress and only showed their gorgeous liveries when they flew down to open the chariot door with their antennae for the queen to alight the damp would have spoiled their feather coats so it was convenient for two reasons it saved her majesty the expense of waterproof overcoats and carriage umbrellas after the royal chariot came six more each with four small dragonflies to draw them filled with the lords and ladies in waiting and then a long train of little covered wagons formed of some kind of nut drawn by slow hard-working beetles squirrel and company were the queen's cartwrights i just name it as a sort of advertisement for that active firm as soon as fritz saw who was coming he ran quickly to tell the gnomes and then there was a hurry scurry to get everything in order for the reception of her majesty of fairyland one ran to tell the king who was taking his nap after dinner and shake him awake and then put on his crown properly and straighten out his robe others began to arrange the gold dinner service for the queen to inspect royal people always inspect things they do not look at them like ordinary men and women at least the newspapers say so some hurried away to put on their best clothes and told fritz to do the same one or two tumbled over each other in their haste and what with running tumbling screaming and laughing there had not been such a hurly-burly in gnomeland for many a day however just as the outriders came up to the door with a buzz and a flourish all was ready and the dwarf standing in two rows at the entrance the king came to within six inches and a half of the archway and stood until the carriage door was opened and then advanced and offered his hand to lead the queen to the throne prepared for her on the right side of his you will wonder perhaps how they knew court ceremonials so correctly living down in their underground country so much and never having been presented at a drawing-room but the queen's chamberlain had sent them a book of court etiquette he had written it was considered by his friends a masterpiece for it regulated to within half an inch the distance each person was to approach her majesty and the number of words they might use in answering her questions the gnomes had much fun about this book but sometimes one would pretend to be the queen and would say what do you think of the weather and then they would look in the book for the proper number of words to reply to it one would give too many another too few and then they laughed till the cavern echoed with their merriment and then their jolly little king would call out to know what they were so merry about and they had to act it over again before him and he would laugh as loudly as the rest for you see they lived down there more like one family than like a court and a king and subjects well at last the queen was seated and her people standing behind her the king told the dwarfs to bring in the chests of plate and after they had been inspected by her majesty they were taken to the wagons and put in then she very gracefully thanked the gnomes for the trouble they had taken in making such beautiful things and the king for his costly gift after that she ate some preserved rose-leaf and tasted the conserve of violets and sipped some dissolved dewdrops and then prepared to return to her own country but before she left the king sent for fritz whom the queen recollected at once and pointing to the bracelet said thou must keep that for many years yet i can bestow many gifts on mortals but none equal to thine fritz then she and her long train departed and things went on as usual till fritz had grown to be a tall strong young man and a very skilful workman one day the king sent for him and all the dwarfs and said it is time now that thou shouldst return to thine own land 
we shall miss thee good fritz but thou must come to see us sometimes and bring us any news of what the mortals are doing up there and whether they are getting any wisdom into their dull heads fritz was glad to hear that he might return to the upper world though very sorry to leave his kind merry little friends but how am i to find my way down to you again he asked then they told him that in a lonely place they described to him on the moor that he knew there was a rock that looked like the tower of a castle and behind it was a flat smooth stone which when struck with a hammer gave out a metallic sound when you want to visit us they said you must strike that stone with your hammer and it will be lifted up like a trap door and you will see a flight of stone steps you must come down them and you will arrive here and they showed him a little opening in the king's dressing-room which he had never seen because a curtain was always hung before it you need not bring a light they said for the rock oil has been burning there for years and lightens the passage beautifully and now said the king let us have the best supper you can give and some of our oldest wine to drink to the success of friend fritz otherwise baron von arbeit so they had a merry supper and the next morning fritz took his leave with tears in his eyes and many thanks for all their goodness to him two of the gnomes took him up the secret staircase and when they got to the top they struck the stone with their hammers and it opened and fritz saw he was on the moor where the foundry was where he used to work when he looked round to say farewell to his good little friends they were not to be seen and the stone was in its place again but he carefully observed everything around that he might know it again for it would have made him very sad indeed to think he should never see the kind gnomes and their merry crooked-legged king any more he sat down beside the rock thinking for a long time and rather bewildered for the earth and sky were unfamiliar to him now at length as he saw by the sun it was noonday he rose and walked in the direction of the foundry when he came in sight of it he was surprised to see no smoke coming out of the chimneys and on going up to it he found it was deserted the fires all gone out and not a living thing to be seen fritz then went to find the hut in which the kind workman lived who had been his friend when he had no other in the world he found him digging in his little garden but the place looked very desolate there was scarcely any furniture in the hut and no fire on the hearth and the poor children were all huddled together on some straw trying to keep each other warm when hans that was the name of the father saw fritz he took off his old cap and made a low bow but fritz ran up to him and said do you not know me my dear old friend i am fritz the man stared without speaking he was so astonished at the change in fritz who had grown into a strong handsome young man at last fritz convinced him who he was and then saying he would return soon walked as fast as he could to the nearest town where he hired a cart and put into it plenty of food and clothing and beds for the poor children with a pile of wood for a fire and a bottle of good wine for hans who was almost worn out with poverty and hard work oh what rejoicing there was when the cart stopped at the door and one big basket after another was carried into the hut the children helped to make the fire and hans cooked the supper and fritz poured out the wine into a cup of gold of his own designing that the dwarfs had given him at parting and then they sat down fritz on a cask turned upside down and hans on an old wheelbarrow the two boys and three girls on billets of firewood and the huge fire they had made blazed up the chimney and gave them plenty of light and the big logs crackled and the children laughed and hans and fritz talked together and i think they were as merry as the dwarfs and fritz the first night he supped in the cavern then the children arranged their beds and felt so deliciously comfortable in warm blankets that they soon went to sleep 
but fritz and hans sat talking by the fire for many hours for they had long histories to tell each other fritz told his wonderful adventures first and then hans told him how nothing at the foundry prospered after he was turned away for the master believed all the lies the bad workmen told him and all the best men and boys went away and at last it had to be deserted and was to be sold but no one would buy it and everything had gone to ruin i will purchase it said fritz and you shall be my partner the good little gnomes had given fritz plenty of gold so the next day he bought the foundry and all the moor round it and hans soon collected plenty of the old men and boys to work and the great fires blazed again in the furnaces and the workmen had nice cottages and gardens and every one was contented and happy and so things went on for many years and fritz married gretchen with the golden hair and blue eyes the eldest daughter of hans and he built a beautiful chateau and was called baron von arbeit you must not think that he ever forgot his kind old friends in the mountain he often went to see them and never came back without some beautiful jewels for his wife or a fine cup for his boys and so years passed and fritz and gretchen were keeping their golden wedding and all their children and grandchildren were assembled at the castle and the work people were having a great feast at the works the master and mistress sat in two high-backed chairs on a dais at the end of the great hall and their relations and friends stood near them and in the middle of the hall was a large table on which were put all the beautiful cups and dishes the gnomes had given fritz they had made him one for that day expressly on one side was a young man working in a field on the other an old man sitting under a tree and round the rim of the cup was written at eventide rest when all were assembled fritz and gretchen stood up and their eldest son brought them the golden wedding cup full of wine and they drank the health of all their sons and daughters and of their grandchildren and their relations and friends and when they said friends they smiled to each other for they remembered their kindest of all friends the good little gnomes of the mountain and they knew by the designs and the motto on the cup that the time had come for fritz to take off the bracelet he had worn so long and that the gnomes would fetch it that night to return it to the fairy queen so dear beautiful old gretchen with the silver hair now unclasped the iron armlet and laid it on the table and they saw inside the words truth and industry end of part five Part six of Cecil's Own Book by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Change, not death. There was a bright cloud in the west, rosy and golden, and at rest, it seemed an island of the blest. I gazed upon it as it lay, and wished it there would ever stay and never never melt away but the sun went down and each glorious dye faded away from the darkening sky and i was sad i knew not why there was a bird whose pleasant song all day had sounded the reeds among where the still deep river flowed along but there came a time when it must fly to warmer lands or stay and die when wintry winds swept fiercely by and one soft warm autumnal day it stretched its wings and flew away and i heard no more its cheerful lay there was a plant whose snow-white flower burst into splendour at twilight's hour and beauty and perfume filled the bower and when the gazers at midnight came the queen of the night was still the same and to gather its blossoms they said was shame 
so in its beauty they left it there to fill with scent the midnight air with the stars to gleam on its petals rare but in the morning they found it dead beauty and perfume alike had fled and a withering mass was there instead but the glittering sunbeams and the rain many cloud isles will build again ere another moon shall wax and wane and the bird will come back from across the sea when the young buds are bursting on plant and tree and the air will be filled with its melody and the summer sun will revive the flower and beauty and perfume fill the bower from the soft calm twilight to midnight's hour thus life and death go on for ever nought may the twofold cord dissever tis change unceasing destruction never earth's waters which of all earth's waters dost thou love the best the stream that runneth softly by the water ousel's nest or the wide and solemn river that telleth not of glee but of forces irresistible man cannot stop or flee or the quiet pool where groweth the lily and the reed and where the spotless water birds in the twilight come to feed or the mountain lake that mirroreth the eagle as he soars and the storm clouds as they gather when the mighty thunder roars oh best of all earth's waters i love the mountain stream it speaketh to me ever of the past's bright tender dream when by its dancing waters five happy children played and their ringing laughter mingled with the music that it made o oh, mountain stream thou babblest still ever gaily on the music of that laughter from me and earth has gone the birds of passage a sound of countless wings a dark and wavy line across the sky and then the birds of passage sped away before the gazer's eye over the rivers and the pathless sea o'er the silent desert and o'er the treeless plain where the scorched grass was crackling in the sun waiting for autumn rain onward still on they go nor swerve nor hesitate about their way and on the self-same path they will return some coming day and find their former haunts and build their nests beneath the cottage thatch the harbingers of sunny days for them shall village children watch o oh, wondrous law that through unnumbered ages nought hath broken sure as ebb and flow of ocean's wave unwritten and unspoken homes of the flowers upon the mountain's bow the bright blue gentians have their home buried beneath the drifting snow of many a winter's storm rooted in desert sand or on the barren shore and wet by spray the tamarisk to the lonely wanderer says go hopeful on thy way the cocoa palm trees wave their pendant leaves above the coral isle while at their root the insect makers work tomb and memorial pile on afric's arid plains a strange weird plant spreads out its tattered leaves more like a monster of the deep than aught that life from earth receives in the dim dripping cave where sunbeams die in twilight settled gloom where the shy seal finds for itself a home lulled by the sea waves everlasting boom grows the bright fern that will not bear a change or other winds than ocean waves to fan its glossy fronds but slowly withering dies beside the haunts of man upon the ruined tower where feudal banners waved in days of old the scented wallflower opens to the sun its tufts of brown and gold while on the chalky cliffs its purple sister shares the beetling height with wearied swallows resting ere they take to their old haunts their flight scarcely a spot of earth 
but is a home for you fair gentle things to the sad exile many a tender thought sight of your beauty brings o oh, wise and gracious law that upon matter nature hath impressed awaking living beauty ceaselessly from earth's dead breast in memoriam once in a far-off northern home five happy children played they ran beside the mountain streams and through the pine woods strayed or watched the wild birds on the hills from morn to evening shade one made a mill wheel in a stream another read his book stretched on the sweet thyme-covered bank but oft away would look to where his youngest brother fished for minnows in the brook and ever by the brother's side kept the two sisters dear and borne upon the mountain breeze their laugh came soft and clear to where the mother sat her heart had not then learned to fear for though within her distant grave one fair young sister slept though softly still they breathed her name though still the mother wept and hid deep in her heart of hearts that pure sweet memory kept death is contented with that one such was the mother's dream that bud of beauty will it not my other flowers redeem oh foolish was that mother's thought beside the mountain stream but then these young lives were so glad their hearts so good and pure they filled one home so full of love it seemed it must endure for to fill up such void on earth what solace or what cure there came a change through highland glen walked quietly but four or talked with whispered words within the heather-covered bower or gathered for the sick boy's room green fern or autumn flower there with fair brow and sunny hair upon his couch he lay patient and loving to the last and as he passed away giving sweet words of love to her who wept in wild dismay amid the scenes he loved so well there is a little grave the giant hills behind it tower before it cornfields wave and there with bitter tears they lay to rest their good and brave time passed and then there were but three who wept in speechless woe the young wife mother must she die oh god must this be so it must be but a hideous dream they could not let her go beside the village church a cross tells where that dear one sleeps her boy treads gently there and love untiring vigil keeps and years go by of good and ill but still that mother weeps end of part six end of cecil's own book by anne hawkshaw read by phil benson